Hi everybody, thank you for coming to my channel. Let us listen together introduction. I like to share with you a article over here. So I people cannot tell me or you know that is my own opinion, okay? So let's go right because this is gonna be a, a fast one, I hope. I hope I can finish it as I'm talking about. It says over here and I wrote it down on, on the board behind me. What God wants of you. Believe in God as creator and in his authority as well as in our responsibility to him is almost universal among men. The fact that our daily lives do not measure up to God's standards is also quite generally conceded by the solution to this evident shortcoming is the subject of many theories and religious practices. How can a man please God and be accepted of him? What does God want of me? These are questions that have arises in the hearts of men since the beginning of time. No matter who you are, there is something that God does wants of you, but one obvious problem always presents itself in any attempt to please him or offer some gifts acceptable to him, and that is the fact of man sin is relation to God's absolute holiness. So let me read it again. It's so important over here. It says over here that uh, as the, the problem is present in itself in any attempt to please him or offer some gift acceptable to him, and that is the fact of man's sin in relation to God's absolute holiness. What intelligent man would deny the basic fact of, the, of sin? A positive evidence is displayed with inexorable uh, regular, regularity on the newspapers of the whole world told out of in crimes of violence, greed, hatred, jealousy, rage, spies, lust, worldwide mistrust, and strife. Regardless of date, place, names of individuals, or other details that may vary, each story can be told in one short word, sin. And every person who is honest enough to admit it knows that this infectious virus has festered, festered it to some degree in its own heart and life. The Bible makes clear that sin has separated man from God and placed him under the penalty of God's judgment. As it is written, written there is none righteous. No, not one. You can read it in Romans 3.10. All the scriptures are headed on the board. Okay, uh, God is holy and righteous, and as the great judge of all the earth, his verdict will be perfectly right for every man and within the scope of his law. This verdict um, has been announced for centuries from the pages of his holy word. The wages of sin is death, the soul that sinneth it must die. Death is of necessity a complete separation from the giver of life. To think that God can be brought with money or you know bought with money, time or words, given to the church or to some good cause, or that his verdict can be swayed by influence of church or saint is to expect less of the righteous God judge that uh, then you would demand of a man in a similar position upon earth. Surely God cannot be enticed to break his own law. A prisoner stands before the court, the, ev the evidence has been heard and weighed, he is found guilty of a great crime, for which the law demands that the judge meet out a severe penalty. Can any amount of promises to re reform through 
positive thinking, pledge to devote time and money to good cause or proof of membership in a church and charitable uh, societies uh, ever alter the fact that the prisoner has committed a crime? Would these deeds uh, nullify the penalty demanded by the law? Of course not. Nor can good works or church membership or the act of belonging to any other organization alter for one moment the fact that man is a sinner before God. In a court of law, there is no procedure for adding up the good the accused may have done to see if it will outweigh the crime for which he is being tried. The question there, uh, before the court is simply, guilty or not guilty? And it's the same in the eyes of God. No amount of good deeds can ever nullify the fact of sin. And the evidence of guilty has already been pronounced by God upon the whole race of man. Now we know that whatsoever things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You can read it in Romans 3.19. When the verdict is guilty, has been pronounced in a court of law, if true justice is to be done, friends of the prisoner, no matter who they may be, must have no power to change the verdict of the judge or sway him in his duty under the law. Do you, attend, uh, do you, then, uh, do you then believe that any church body or Official can sway the judgment of Almighty God? What vanity, therefore, to trust in some church, no matter what type it may be, or in some saint that someone may have named an influence to meditate your cause with Almighty God? Can he be influenced to go back upon the righteousness penalty of himself, has pronounced upon sin? Can he be persuaded to compromise, uh, compromise yeah, with the uh, undeniable fact that our guilt before him? Certain, uh, certain basis logic leads us to the inevitable uh, conclusion that if any man is to be accepted of God, it must be upon a righteous basis, not on the basis of penalty or penance, a prayer, ritual, good deeds, a gift of time and money, or the influence of a church or a saint. None of this can alter the fact of our sin and guilt before a righteous, holy God are therefore only bribes uh, attempting to uh, prevent judgment. This attempt may work at times among men, but never with God. The teaching of Jesus Christ is recorded in the New Testament Gospel uh, very strongly emphasized this point. If there was one thing that Jesus constantly stressed during his life upon earth, it was the fact that God is neither deceived by nor pleased with an outward show of piety, even when it comes to religious attendance to ordinances that he himself gave to the Jews of old. In fact, God's eyes pierce through all these things to examine what? Man's very heart. In a well-known sermon of the, of the Sermon on the Mount, Christ dealt uh, not with external, but with those things that are the result of a right attitude of heart. It says over here, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That is, uh, that, oh no, that this is not the natural condition of man's heart is quite evident, and the Bible reiterated the fact again and again in such verse as Jeremiah 79. It says over there, 
The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperate wicked who can know. You see? Who can know it. Here again, Scripture interprets Scripture, and we as human beings try to uh, reach God with our own efforts. And God says, I have my law, take it or leave it. Uh, the Lord uh, searched the heart. Thus, the question of man's sin, the fruit, must not only be settled in affecting reconciliation to God or on a righteous basis, but sin itself, is the root, okay, must be put away and the deceitful and desperate wicked heart made pure in the sight of God. Did the righteous uh, rit rituals of the Jews bring about this uh, purity of heart? Here are the words of Christ spoken to a group of the religious leaders. O oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Matthew 12, 34. For out of the abundance of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murder, adulteries, fornication, theft, false witnesses, blasphemies. You can read also in Matthew 15:19. Uh, these words of Christ are an indictment of the heart of man as well as of the form, ritual, and hypocrisy of the religious world. Thus Christ, pro thus Christ proclaimed that because the heart of man is corrupt, his good works cannot be accepted by God. Uh, even the religious ordinances once given by God to the Jews are a type and example of truth that was to be revealed in Christ because perverted by their evil hearts and the empty form that remained had become an abomination to God. I haven't written it down, but uh, my mind all of a sudden is have a step in my mind is Isaiah 64, um, yeah, 64, 4 or 6. It says over there also, it says over there, that all our good deeds are like filthy rags. Jesus thought that the very essence of what God requires of man is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You can read it also in Matthew 23, 36 to 40, and Luke 10, 25, 28. God wants the true love and devotion, what? Of the heart. But how can the heart of man, which contains the root of sin, as Christ described it, produce the true love and devotion that God requires? And how can a condemned sinner be brought to the place of reconciliation and love before a holy God? How can God be just and yet pardon the sinner? How can he dispense love and mercy to a sinful race without uh, compromising righteousness and justice? The answer could only be, be uh, devised by God's infinite wisdom, and it is the most wonderful message ever heard by human ears. God's answer to this seeming dilemma is proclaimed by the gospel, his good news to man. The message is one of the perfect love, not for a prostitution of, of, of infin infinite, uh, infinite mercy, but to compromise of complete and absolute pardon, yet the strictest of justice. It is the marvelous story of infinite love giving its all to win us back to himself, the story of God himself who came down to earth to inhabit a body of flesh and blood, was born of a virgin, that as a man he might be our representative and as our representative might take our place in judgment, paying the extreme pen penalty demand against sin by his own holy law. Nevertheless, 
many would fail to respond in repentance, submission, and love to the Christ of, of the cross, who stand with outstretched hands that still bear the nail prints and pleads, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 28. So here again, God okay, give that beautiful uh, illustration, but also through his word. God wants you to bow before him just as you are, a guilty lost sinner, accepting gratefully and sincerely the pardon and forgiveness he offers in the person of Christ. And said over there, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him or on him should not perish but have everlasting life. You can read it in John 3.16. Surely it is evidence that what God wants of you is not some outward form of religious uh, ritual, but is instead an inner reality. He doesn't want your penance, but the complete submission of your will, not your gift of any material thing, but the true love and devotion of your heart. Yes, our hearts are corrupt by nature, and it is only by the new birth through faith in Christ on the basis of his having paid the full penalty for our sins that God can forgive us, create within us a clean heart, and accept us in the person of his Son. It says over there, John 3.3, 3, what? Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Oh, the wonder of God's salvation. Our submission to God is not in the final analysis, analysis the giving up of anything, but rather the receiving of the infinite everything that He offers to us in Christ. God wants to become, to bestow His love, His riches, His grace, His infinite blessing in an endless flood upon you forever and forever. The question is this again. Won't you right now stop trying to pacify God with religious uh, ritual or some gift of, your, of yours to Him and just by faith accept Christ as your Savior, surrendering control of your will into His hand and giving Him the true love and devotion of your heart so that He can fill you with Himself. A God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were, uh, we were dead in sin, has quickened us together with Christ. That is the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in, in kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Because it says over them, for by grace you are saved through faith, and death not of yourself. It is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You can read it in Ephesians 2, 4 till 9. Mercy, God's great love, make us alive, the exceeding riches of His grace, His kindness, being saved through faith as the gift of God uh, throughout the ages to come. Only the God who has communicates to us through His Word, who is the Creator of the universe, has provided for His rebellious creatures a way for them to be reconciled to Himself, a way for them to live with Him forever. No other God or God or supreme deity or force worshiper among men has offered Himself or itself sacrificially for the salvation of his creatures. Wow, isn't it beautiful? No other God claims to be loved and then truly demonstrate 
that uh, communicate virtue by subjecting himself to a humiliating death upon a cross as he pays the full penalty for the sins of mankind. The penalty has to be paid in order to satisfy divine justice. It involves not only Christ's uh, physical death, but his experience of the Son being separated from the Father. The dread of that uh, event was foreseen by Jesus as he knelt before the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, then comes Jesus uh, with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrow, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little further, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. You can read it in Matthew 26, 36 till 39. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Luke 22, 44. So here again, uh, I liked over here, but over here it's in, uh, says over here, in the 18th century, the hymn writer uh, Charles Wesley wrote uh, this incredible, wonderful word, Amazing Love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. The fact of love is beyond our ability to fathom, yet it is even more incomprehensible okay, uh, to understand why anyone would not want to receive it. In John chapter 15, verse 30, uh, 13, Jesus informed us of what that act means even for sinful uh, humanity. Greater, uh, greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. In John 5, 13. The question is this, who would not want to be his friend for all eternity? So folks, I, I read, quickly read this. I hope you get the point because like I said before, I experienced this, you know, when uh, 1970, when I gave my heart to the Lord. And now I know, and I know, and you can read it also in uh, 1 John 5:13. It says over there that you may know that you have eternal life. It's not a hope or a guess, folks. I know for sure. When my time, when my, when my time comes, where I will spend my eternity, and that's why it's so beautiful. I think I read also here in read in John 24. Look what it says: "Fairly, fairly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passes from death unto life." I stop by now over here. I hope that uh, this, that what I share and what I read, you know, uh, will encourage you and also warn you. And it's a beautiful question, right? What God wants of you? I did it. I hope you will do the same thing. Because that means when the time comes, we'll meet each other in heaven. That's the whole beauty of the gospel. We spend our eternity with God. And we will see Christ as He is. Like He set out His honor, remember, of the cross, we will still see His imprint of those nails to prove. And quickly, I mean, if I can remember, I mean, I remember, but if I can pick up over here, I like the scripture in Hebrews, I think, is 412 if I'm not mistaken 
Uh, oh, look what it says in 4.12. That's why I like to give you the word. Look what it says. Four, Hebrews 4.12. When the Spirit moves, the Spirit moves, folks. Uh, for the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, even to the division of soul and spirit and of joint and marrow. Wow. It is a the sensor of the thoughts and intents and intents of the heart. Folks, that's all I can say to you. I have to go. Read those scriptures again. It's Hebrews 12, 4, okay? Like I said, I love the Word of God because that's what I go by. I live by it, okay? Like Christ says in Matthew 4, 4, remember? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded of the mouth of God. I hope you can say amen on that one. And I have to say it again. If uh, you have got anything out of my video, give me the thumb up. If you like to subscribe, you know what to do. Ring the notification bell. Now I will say then, until next time, God bless you. Bye-bye now.